All right, if you guys uh, can ready your Bibles, uh, we're going to go to Judges once again. I say ready your Bibles, it's kind of like ready your battle stations. We're getting ready to go off to war. We're getting ready to face some things that we're going to lear- learn about today. Uh, we're going to go to Judges chapter 12. So if you guys have that, go ahead and pull that out. Last week we ended uh, our service with a truly sad story. Um, we we ended uh, this this. Um, Jephthah, we met Jephthah last week. He was the uh, he was the ninth judge in this whole uh, series that we're doing and going through each and every judge. Uh, but Jephthah totally made this terrible deal with God. If you weren't with us, if you want to um, hold true to the kind of the story, basically he said, you know, he's he was the judge over Israel during this time, and he said, God, I'm going to be this great leader. If you want me to, um, I I will go and totally take on the enemy and God if I know you know if you're on our side and you give us this victory and you give us win I'm going to give you the first thing that I meet when I pull into my compound when I come to my house when I show up at my front front door after war I will sacrifice the first thing that greets me at the door and he was probably thinking some sort of animal a, a crooked goat or whatever walking up to him you know it's like I showed you the picture of my or the video of my dog who greets me every single day with a smile literally a smiling dog uh, but the the thing that greets him at the door of the first is his one and only child his daughter and he he stayed true to to the promise he made with God and sacrificed his daughter. And it was all a twisted thing because God doesn't want human sacrifices. He doesn't want that. He wants a sacrifice of our hearts. And it was this tragic story. So it kind of leaves us to this point uh, where we are now. And God wants us to transform our minds, renew our hearts. And that was the whole premise of last week's message and uh, keeping our focus on God. And uh, that really, I mean, in a sense, is what, what what this whole series is is trying to keep our focus on God, trying to uh, trying to uh, keep our focus on God. You know, when we look at these judges, God used them for specific reason. There's thirteen of them. He used them for a specific reason. And uh, but ultimately what happened is they turned their back on God and they were flawed, either personality trait or just some of their leadership skills. They were flawed. And uh, we're going to learn about the most flawed one we will come to to date today. Uh, We're going to start and we're but before we get that, we have to uh, talk about some other ones. We're going to talk about some three three minor judges today. And then we're going to talk about the big dude himself, the myth, the man, the legend, Samson. All right. Uh, I know some of you guys know he's he's the background to our message. He's the big when when you, when you take a survey and you're on you know you're on Family Feud and and uh, what's the what's the uh, what's the Steve Harvey's up there with his big teeth and he's saying you know survey says you know probably the number one answer for if you'd have to name a judge would be Samson the guy who had superhuman strength. But before we get to that, before we get to the myth, the man, the legend himself, uh, we have to kind of see and find out who these minor judges are, because in chronological order, it, it kind of leads up to that. So if you guys have your Bibles, I'm going to switch over real quick here. Go to Judges chapter 12. Jephthah led Israel for six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in a town in Gilead. After him, Ibsen of Bethlehem led Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave his daughters away in marriage to those outside of his clan. And for his sons, he brought in 30 young women as wives from outside his clan. Ibsen led Israel for seven years. Verse 10, then Ibsen died and was buried in Bethlehem. After him, Elon, the son of the Zebulonite, led Israel 10 years. Then Elon died and was buried in Ahalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, son of Hillel, from Terathen, led Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. He led Israel for eight years. Then Abdon, son of Hillel, died and was buried at Pirithon in Ephraim in the hill country of of the Amalekites. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this scripture. Lord, you are such a good God, and we look forward to the things that you have 
in our in our hearts today that you have prepared for us. Lord, we're sitting at the dinner table ready to eat the word and what you have for us. Lord, help us to consume everything that you have in line for us today. Speak to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. First off, let's get to a point here. I don't understand why they keep putting all these terrible words in the Bible, all these terrible names. <laughs> I mean, how many of you guys would like to name your son, uh, you know, Elon or Jephthah or Ibsen or something like that? I mean, it's crazy. Could you imagine going to school and having that? I, I have this story um, about names, and I think I've shared this with you guys before, but uh, one of my, he's, he's become a really good friend of mine, but when I was in high school, he was, he was a brand new teacher, and we, we struck friendship through high school, and then afterwards, we became really good friends, and actually, he's the principal of my old school right now. We're, we still remain in contact. We're great friends, and uh, he was telling me one day about his, uh, this story when he was, when he was student teaching. He was student teaching in a more of a urban area. We'll just say that. It was more of an urban area. And he was reading this, reading a role for the first time in the student teaching. And uh, of course, he's this, he's this skinny white guy from the Midwest, right? And he's reading this role call and he's going through all these names and he gets this one. He's like, La'a Washington. And this girl stands up in the back of the class and I kid you not, she goes, she goes, it's not La'a, it's Ladasha. Her name was L-A hyphen A. So I'm like, I'm reading through this, and I'm like, okay, I can understand the pain when you're looking at biblical names or you're looking at just traditional names and different things like that. They, it's hard for us to grasp in society in general. But anyway, we move on, and we meet these three new judges uh, that chronically, chronologically follow Jephthah. And um, really, we don't know much about them. We don't, we don't know much about them. We haven't, there's, there's little to know about that. Um, I talked about, we talked about Shamgar many weeks ago where he had one verse. Well, we knew a little bit about him, that he defeated 600 Philistines with an ox goad. But the one thing we see here is we have all these different scriptures of these different, uh, these different leaders. And it doesn't say anything about what their name is, how long they served. All right. So from these verses, um, what we do know, what we do need to see is that the idea of the judges cycle, um, basically the idea of the judges cycle, the people have turned their backs on God, they've been oppressed by an enemy, they cry out to God, God sends them a judge, the judge rules, the judge dies, it's all back starts the cycle all over again, okay? So from these few scriptures that we see of these three individuals, we see that the judges' cycle just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And um, these judges raise up to save Israel. Now, we don't know how they saved Israel. We don't know what kind of battles. We don't know if they were just intellectually smart and outsmarted the enemy or struck a deal with them and said, hey, uh, you know, let's, let's do this. Or were they military leaders and went to war and led an uprising among the Israelites? We don't know. All we know is their names, how long they served for. And um, when we look at this, this is vastly different than some of the other judges we've seen. All right. And I will say this, that over, if we throw Jephthah into this, if we, if we include Jephthah, the, the judge before, if we throw him in that, we have four judges here, including Jephthah, that served for an average of seven years over a 30-year time period. So four leaders over a 30-year time period. That's totally different than what we have seen. When we met Othniel, the first judge, he served for 40 years. The next one, Ehud, 80 years. Deborah and Brock, 40 years. Gideon, 40 years. Tola and Jair, 45 years combined, okay? So we've got these judges, these three new, three new judges, and then if we add Jeff, the one last week in there, they've only served an average of seven years total. I think, what is it, seven, eight, and ten of these new judges today, all right? So they, that doesn't mean that they were poor leaders. That doesn't show, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were bad leaders because they only served for seven years. This is not a kingship. Someone didn't just come and just want to whack them off because they were terrible, okay? They didn't just want to just knock them dead because of that, all right? This, this doesn't have to do anything with their leadership. This was just solely how long God wanted to use them during the time that he needed them to. All right, does that make sense? 
So we really don't know what happened to them or why their reign was short, but we know God used them to save Israel. All right, so let's, I I try to spend as much time as we can on each judge, but theoretically and realistically, we don't know a lot on these three guys. So we're going to hit four judges today. We're going to run through these three really quick. But we beat judge number 10. He was Ibsen. He ruled for seven years. He gave his sons and daughters away to outsiders for marriages. Um, and though these, and through these marriages, Ibsen was able to establish alliances. More than likely, the reason he did that was to establish alliances with the enemies around him. He didn't marry within the Jewish people. So this... This could have been, we, we don't know, it could have been great for Israel because it could have established alliances with other kingdoms around them, or it could have been miserable for Israel. I'd like to think the latter there, that it was probably more troublesome for them because they were interbreeding and they were inner, you know, having relationships with the enemy, okay? That's what I'd like to think. But we really don't know much about them. We don't know what happened, but through this action, like I said, we don't know if this benefited Israel or was a negative effect towards Israel? Our judge number 11. So that's 10. That's Ibsen. Number 11, Elon. Elon was the smart in- inventor. He changed the dynamic of transportation by introducing the Tesla car. He brought uh, space exploration to the private specter- sector through the SpaceX program. All right, just seen if some of you guys are awake. That's the wrong Elon. That's Elon Musk I'm talking about, the the guy who's the inventor of Tesla cars and does the space. But really, we know more about Elon Musk than we do Elon the judge. Um, Yeah, I can see some of you guys' eyes like, what is he talking about? What the heck is going on? Was there space travel during this time? They invented the Tesla way back then? No, yeah, okay. So uh, I just had to throw that one in there. for. But in all reality, we really don't know anything about Elon except that he was the first and only judge from the tribe of Zebulun. And he ruled for a total of 10 years. Okay? So that's judge number 9, judge number 10, or sorry, judge number 10, judge number 11, and then now we have judge number 12, Abdon. He was the one who allowed his son to ride on donkeys. Okay, I always like this. This is the third example, the second judge that we see of um, of donkeys intertwined into the mix. It's like, why are they including donkeys into this? Well, here's the thing. Donkeys were a sign of wealth. Donkeys were a sign of kingship. It meant you had a lot of money. When Jesus, uh, the week before, we're getting close to that because Easter's coming, but on Palm Sunday, the week before Jesus was to be crucified on the cross, what happened? They brought him into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, saying, the king is here, he's here to save us, we have the king. So kings rode on donkeys. It was... It was just, it was, it was a fact. They didn't ride on, cam- I mean, they didn't ride on camels. They didn't ride on horses. They, they, were, they were donkeys. They were, it, it was a sign of wealth. So if you had a lot of donkeys, you had a lot of wealth. So we see this guy, uh, it's important to know this. He was, you know, like Gideon. When we talked about Gideon and his son Abimelech, they kind of had a kingship of his own. When we looked at Jair, he tried to establish a kingship as well, um, you know, with the whole Abimelech story, Abimelech just, I mean, he was trying to make Israel a monarchy as opposed to just these judges ruling over. All right. So we don't know much about Abdon, but we know that he had donkeys and he had great wealth and tradition from what we've seen in, in judges is that never really a good thing because the pride and everything gets to these leaders and they become flawed. So really, we don't know. So there you go. In a matter of minutes, in a matter of seconds, we flew through three judges. All right? Let's just wash our hands, clean them. We're done with them. (laughs) All right? So with the death of Abdon, it leaves us with a transition to our final judge. And the Bible goes into great detail in this final judge. And it, Samson is talked about the most out of all the judges. And realistically, if you look at the story of Samson, he probably is the most flawed individual that we see. Maybe not, but by record of what we have, he was, you know, a basket full of mess. I mean, that's really what Samson was. 
Um, now, you're probably thinking, you're probably saying to me, well, preacher, how in the world have we already ran through all the judges and you're going to be touching on Samson this week? Well, there's over the next couple weeks, there's just a lot to intake through the story of Samson. And there's a lot of knowledge to gain from that. So we're going to spend the next couple weeks really focusing on this specific flawed hero. We spent a couple weeks on Gideon. We try to spend a week on each one. As you know, today we spent the first 15 minutes on, on these three that we really don't know much about. But we know so much about Samson. And uh, we want to really die, digest his, his story and, um, and really kind of see who Samson was. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into it. Um, we're going to pull up the scriptures. It's going to be here on the screen for you. We got a lot of reading to do, so just bear with me. If you don't have your phones, if you don't have your Bibles, that's fine. We have it up here on the screens. You can watch those, but we're going to read here. Um, and like I said, there's 25 verses, so it's going to be a lot of reading. So if you just bear with me, this is what we need to dig in to get to what we need to see today. All right. So here we go. Judges chapter 13. We're going to verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There once again, they're doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he came from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, You will be pregnant, and you will have a son. Now then drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord, I beg you. Let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah, and the angel uh, the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband, Manoah, was not with her. The woman hurried up to tell her husband, "Here, he, yeah, He's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be be the rule that governs, governs the body's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or fermented drink, eat anything unclean. She must do everything that I have commanded her. Commanded her. Verse 15. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, uh, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that this was the angel of the Lord. Verse 17. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that we will honor you when your word comes true. He replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again Manoah and his wife, uh, to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was an angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But the wife answered, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us these things, or now told us this. 
The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He, gr- he grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in uh, Manna, Dan, between Zorah and Estol. All right. So that's a lot to in- to intake there. But um, it starts off with the phrase that we see time in and time again in the book of Judges. What? The people did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's documented once again. Up until this point, it had been paraphrased and, and phrased through the whole book of the through the whole uh, book of Judges. You know, multiple times. I think it's like six or seven times. So they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So that's the first part of that cycle starting again. And they were captured for forty years from the Philistines. All right. By continuing to insert this phrase, the author of Judges makes it a point that the Israelites' perception of their behavior wasn't wrong. All right? So the Israelites, once again, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, it's, they were living in sin and they were okay with it. All right? This was a constant thing that happened through the book of Judges. They were living in sin They were okay with it. They were worshiping other gods. They were okay with it. This wasn't the God that (laughs) established a covenant with. They were practicing polytheism. They were worshiping pagan gods. That's what they, and they were okay with that. But that was evil in the eyes of the Lord. By seeing this and seeing that they were okay with this, it gives us two truths about sin. This is kind of what we need to get today. Sin does not ultimately consist of violating our personal standards or our community standards, but rather consists of violating God's will for us. This is kind of our modern thinking. Think of this, you know. If we think that sin is okay, or we think something is okay, and our society okays that, then it's not sinful. And that's what the Israelites were dealing with that during that during this time. It was okay to worship this God. It was okay to offer this kind of sacrifice. With Jephthah last week, it was okay to offer human sacrifice because that's really ultimately what the other gods demanded. So it's okay. So it's not really a sin. But if you read back into the establishment of the Jewish people and their rules in Leviticus, it was detestable in God's eyes to offer a human sacrifice. Okay, so they were living in sin, but they didn't realize it because they just said, hey, you know what? Everybody's doing it, so it's got to be okay." And it's so interesting because that's kind of how our society is today. All right. Hey, you know, whatever, whatever part of abortion is there, it's okay because society's okay with it. They passed it. It's legal. It's legal to do this. It's legal to do that. It's legal to do this. But in God's eyes, it's not. Just because it's illegal or just because it's legal to do something doesn't mean that it is okay in the eyes of the Lord. So that's kind of our modern thinking. That's kind of how it is. When we look at, you know, and I'm going to use this as a total crazy example here, but if we look at Adolf Hitler, right? All right. We look at one of the most terrible people in humanity. It was okay to, you know, capture Jews and and homosexuals and mentally handicapped people and take them to a concentration camp and to kill them. It was okay. But that doesn't mean that it was okay in God's eyes because it was murder. It was terrible things that was, you know, so just because society now our Western society, America, that was terrible for us to see this going on. But in German Nazis, the, the Nazi party, and in Germany, it was, people were okay with that because that was just the way it was. But it, it's wrong, you know. When we look at when we look at the um, um, the venture of in, in the Middle East and what's going on in the Middle East and and the rise of ISIS and all this stuff, their teachings and their education say it is okay for murder. It is okay to behead somebody. It is okay to throw somebody off a cliff if they do not accept our views. Okay? That doesn't mean that it's okay in the okay in the eyes of the Lord. Just because society says something like that doesn't mean that it's okay. Now, those are extreme examples. All right? But sin doesn't ultimately consist of us violating our personal standards or our community standards but rather consists of violating God's standards. That's number one. The second truth about sin is the deception of sin. 
It reminds us as humans how easily self-deceived we are. Just like the Israelites, we're in self-denial when it comes to our sin. We're rationalizing our sins. How many of you guys have done that before? It's like, well, hey, you know, I just told a little white lie. <laughs> What's the difference between a white lie and a, I don't know, purple lie or green lie? I don't know. <laughs> What's the difference between just a little lie and something big? What's the difference between, you know, this crime and this crime? What's the difference between, you know, this and this? Sin is sin. Doesn't matter if it's a little white lie or you're cheating on your spouse. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, injecting someone something into a woman, then, you know, killing a child as it comes out of the womb, all right? It doesn't matter. Sin is sin. We cannot justify our sins, and that's what the Israelites were doing during that time. That's what, unfortunately, we're seeing in our society. We're starting to justify some of our actions and saying, you know what, it's, it's okay. It's not hurting anybody. It's equal rights. It's this. It's that. It's that. You know, so we have to, we have to keep our eyes and our focus on God and let him tell us what is wrong and what is right. We can't let our neighbor tell us what's wrong or right. We cannot let this theology over here tell us what's wrong or right. We have to let God tell us what's wrong or right. And unfortunately, that's what the Israelites were doing during this time. They were not looking to God. So the story progresses, and we see the birth of this final judge, Samson. And um, what's really interesting to note about Samson, and I don't know if you caught this, But Samson was the first and only judge to be set aside before birth. If you remember, God sought um, Gideon from his tribe. He was least of the least. And if you know, if you if you look at all the other judges, they they rose up through power somehow, or God called them to do something, or you know, they were you know Othniel. He was the nephew of Caleb. Okay. God used them in a certain way. Samson was called before he was even born. Does that remind you of somebody? Does that remind you of somebody? Right? Jesus, John the Baptist, they were called before they were even born. The Holy Spirit, uh, through uh, the angel comes and speaks to the mother, speaks to the father, and says, hey, guess what? You're going to have a child. He's going to change the world, that, yada, yada, yada. All right? That's what happens in the situation. The parents are visited by this angel. Mom was barren. She couldn't have a child. Once again, there's some more correlation there. All right? Abraham, who is the father of the Israelite nation, God came to him and said, hey, I'm going to establish my covenant with you and your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren and their children and their children and their children. And he's saying, what are you talking about, God? My wife's 90 years old. We've never had a child. It's not going to happen. And what happens? His wife was barren at 90 years old. She has a child. When we see the story of, of Hannah, Hannah wanted a child so bad that she made a deal with God and said, God, you know, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate him to the service of you. Hannah had, um, she had uh, Samuel. <laughs> I was blanking there for a second. She had Samuel. And then we look in the, in the New Testament and we look at some of the other stories and we look at John the Baptist. You know, he, <laughs> there's a whole story about John the Baptist where dad didn't believe it and he was shut up until the baby was born, right? All right? The angel of the Lord closed his mouth. And then, of course, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, all right? There's all these different stories of this happening. Samson was, in a sense, the savior of Israel during that time. They were in bondage for 40 years. The Philistines were terrible, you know, heathenistic people. And the Israelites cried out for a savior. And through this process, and after talking with this angel, his parents were commanded by... They were commanded by this angel that Samson is to take the Nazarite vow. Now, I don't know, we don't really have good examples of Nazarite vows today because it's something that happened back when, all right? But the Nazarite vow was this life of commitment, 
um, you can find it in number six. If you really want to get into that, it's in Numbers chapter six. It talks about all that stuff. But it was, it was this sign of commitment that you're looking to God with great intensity. You're not worried about the things around you in life. You're not worried about the different things, but looking towards God. It was a sign of commitment. It's, it's like our modern day fasting. We don't fast because it's fun. If you've ever fasted, it's terrible. <laughs> it's not fun. But we fast because it draws us closer to God. It gets us one with Him. It, 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 it takes us to a new level. And, and that's the way the Nazarite vow was during this time. But the Nazarite vow had three specific stipulations. You can't cut your hair during the period of time. You cannot drink or produce any drink from the vine, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. You cannot have contact with any dead body. Now that seems extreme. Okay? That seems extreme that this angel of the Lord is telling is is telling, hey, your baby, don't ever cut its hair. I hope she wasn't a hairdresser. She'd be out of business, right? Don't cut this baby's hair. But don't let him touch or mess around with dead things. Don't let him drink anything off the vine. Because I have a plan for this guy's life. And if he can follow it, I will save my people. So after retaining all this knowledge and hearing about this Nazarite vow that Samson had to undergo, how does that affect our lives? How does it affect our daily lives? Well, here's the thing. God gives us instructions how to serve Him. He gives us instructions how to be good people. He gives us instructions how not to sin. It's all found here or phone or it's 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 all found in the word of god it's found through our communication with him all right that's the nazarite vow that we have he gives us everything he gives us what we need but he really wants to give us something even more and unfortunately that's what the people were struggling with during this whole process the 400 plus years of what was going on through Israel. He wanted to give them more. He wanted to give them everything. He just wanted them to turn and say, hey, God, we want you, instead of crying out to God when they were in trouble. They had everything they needed to know. They knew who God was, but they continued to turn their back on God. God really wants to give us something better. We have all the instructions here, but God wants to give us something even better. He wants to give us himself. He wants to give us his spirit. And it got me kind of thinking a little bit about navigation. If I sat here and I took a piece of paper and I wrote you the exact directions to my house, there's nobody in this room that can drive and have ever, you know, looked at, uh, looked at a map before. I could give you the directions to my house. All right. That's easy. Be easy. But what's even better is if I sat next to you in the passenger seat and I told you the way to go. Because here's the deal. I know from this route from the church to my house, which has the least amount of stoplights and stop signs. I don't want you to go through those stop signs. I know where where the cops will sit most of the time. So if we don't throw our seatbelts on, we'll be all right. All right. I know that if you go into one side of my alleyway to get to my garage, you're going to bottom out your car and scrape the bottom of your car. But on the other way, it's a nice, easy, easy, smooth transition up into our driveway. All right? So, but that's what it is with God. He gives us the instructions to go through life, but we need him in the passenger side while we're driving because he knows everything and he just wants us to communicate with him. He just wants to give us everything. We have all the directions we need in life. We know what it takes to be a Christ follower. We know what it takes to not sin. But we need God each and every hour of the day. We need him taking our hands and taking us step by step by step. Does that make sense? Going through life with God on our side is just simple as asking him, just saying, God, I want you to lead me. 
I've used this example before, but I, I, I've never been a fan of those Jesus is my co-pilot bumper stickers. The whole campaign, you guys have ever heard that before? Jesus is my co-pilot. I don't like that because I don't want Jesus being my co-pilot. I want him being my pilot. I, I don't, I, I don't want to go through life making wrong turn after wrong turn where I can hand him the keys and say, God, lead me through my life. That's the way it is. We need to say, God, I want you to be in control of my life. I want you to lead me. I want you to take me from point A to point B. I don't care how we do this, God, but I want you to be in control. Guys, I'll be honest with you. I'm facing some crazy issues right now in my personal life that I don't know how I'm going to solve it. I'm not going to get into much detail with that, but I'm sitting here like, what in the world is going on? But the one thing I know that I can't do that on my own. I need God to do a miracle. I need God to step up, and I need to just say, you know what? Here's the keys, God. I don't have my keys on me. But here's the keys, God. Take me to where I need to be. I know I need to focus on you. I know I need to pray more. I I know I need to get in the scriptures, but I want you to show me your ways. Show me what you want me to do. It's more than just a Nazarite vow. What you're going to find, what we're going to see over the next couple weeks is Samson's going to break that vow. He's going to do things. He's going he's to eat honey out of a dead carcass. All right? Can't touch it. He's going to drink wine. Can't drink wine. And guess what? His hair will get cut. The three things that he was told not to do, it's going to happen to him. And the Spirit of God will leave him from that. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do, but he failed to let God lead him. We're going to learn that more about Samson in the next coming weeks. But going through life with God on our side is just as simple as asking him to be there for us. We know what it means to be a Christ follower, but we need to have him in our life guiding us each and every day. If you need more of him today, I just want to take some time. I mean, we, we, do, we do this every week, but just close your eyes, bow your head. Nobody looking around. Maybe you're saying, Pastor John, I need more of Jesus in my life. I'm not letting him lead me. I'm not letting him guide me the way I should. Just a quick raise of the hand. Just raise your hand. I see those hands. I see those hands. Here's what we're going to do. If you raised your hand, I want you to mean this prayer in your heart. We're going to pray that God will just continue to lead us. I, I struggle with that a lot too, I'll be honest with you. I struggle with giving God everything and letting him take control of my life. If you know me, if you ask my wife, I'm a controlling kind of person. <laughs> so it's hard to let somebody else take the reins of my life, even though he's the king of kings. But if you're that way and you raise your hand, I want to pray for you today. And I want to pray that God will just take over your life. Take complete control. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for my friends here today. I thank you what you are doing in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit speaking to us right now in this moment. Lord, even though these scriptures and these stories and these these promises are hundreds, thousands of years old, Lord, we know that you can still speak to us through those words. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts right now. Lord, I pray right now for the ones that raised their hand, Lord. I pray that you will give them uh, the ability to let you take control. Father, we are stubborn people, and so sometimes it's hard for us to just say, God, you're in control. But Lord, I pray that you will just speak to our hearts right now and let you take control. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this church. I thank you that you're growing us not in size, but not just in size, but spiritually growing us as a church. You're drawing us closer to you. That's the purpose of what we want, Lord. We want to love, share, equip, and serve. And part of that equipping process, Lord, is getting closer to you and knowing more of you. Father, help us to crave more of you. Father, lead us and guide us each in every day of our lives. Lord, I pray blessings over every single person that made it out on this cold, snowy morning. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We love you, God. In your mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen.
and amen.